All right, this has gone too far. Let's take a step back. Hello world, it's Siraj, and the blockchain space has been plagued with scams, apps with bad user experiences, and some major technical issues. I'm gonna talk about what's gone wrong in the space, what's gone right, then give some insight into how this technology will evolve in 2019 using programmatic examples. For context, two years ago, I wrote a book called Decentralized Applications, Harnessing Bitcoin's Blockchain Technology. I also, this year, taught a 10-week course titled Decentralized Applications at School of AI. Clearly, I've been very excited about the potential for this technology, but if we bring up Google and type in Bitcoin, the first ever cryptocurrency created, all of the results are about its price. They are debating whether or not it's a good investment opportunity. And all of this is coming from mainstream organizations that have big distribution channels. So they're framing how the public thinks about Bitcoin. Symbiotes are an endangered species. Invest in Venom coin. And it of course can be, but that's not the real value of this technology. Let me explain. The Bitcoin network stores all of its transactions in a database. This database is distributed. Each node in the network stores a copy of it. And this database is arranged in sequential block objects that each store transaction signatures linked together via pointers to form a chain, aka a blockchain. Certain nodes called miners use their computers to convert kinetic energy in the form of electricity into a ledger block. And this distributed mining machine repeatedly performs operations until it solves a really simple math puzzle. The result, a single hash, which itself takes very little energy to compute, is a direct representation of the huge ball of energy that was required to produce it. It's a mathematical proof that the block was minted. Therefore, for an attacker wanting to modify any of this transaction data maliciously would need to have more computing power than half the network to do so. And even if this attacker used all of the supercomputers in the world combined, it still wouldn't be enough since Bitcoin is such a massive network. That's why it's still intact a decade later. The Bitcoin network enabled trust and cooperation between humans at a scale never seen before, specifically around securing and maintaining its ledger. And this model of trust is built on math and physics, mainly the proof of work algorithm. Institutional trust has been the predominant model of trust today, but it's not perfect. The Equifax hack, the Wells Fargo scandal, the drama over user data at Facebook, Dunkin Donuts in India. These are just a few examples of how institutional trust has failed us. Trust based on math and physics helped ensure that astronauts could land on the moon safely. And we can also use it to guarantee that no one can modify Bitcoin's bookkeeping record. This is an incredibly powerful idea. If this trust is based on math and physics, it's programmable. We can engineer entirely new incentive structures. Maybe we can incentivize people not to merely mine blocks, but to do social good for the world, to volunteer, to help make the lives of other humans better in ways that were previously not profitable. We could also incentivize them to store files, share computing power, collaborate in all sorts of novel ways. Bitcoin was the first decentralized application, or DAP. In my book, I talked about a new business model where users could get paid by app-specific tokens for their contributions, and they could use these app tokens to access certain features. If the app was successful, these tokens would accrue in value over time. This idea was later dubbed initial coin offerings or ICOs, and it became the de facto way that any decentralized startup raised money. In just a few lines of code, most often done on a blockchain network called Ethereum, anyone could create a new market, issuing a set of tokens to people globally. They could raise money not from venture capitalists, but from the crowd. The problem with the ICO model is that we've seen so many low quality proof of concepts, meaning 
During the public sale, lots of these startups only have a white paper and a website, no code. It was perverted from an innovative way to raise startup capital without selling your soul to venture capitalists to how fast can we scam a whole generation of crypto suckers out of their money before regulators catch us. Every time some scammer gets caught, I imagine the yacht scene from Wolf of Wall Street. I've watched it like 500 times. I was, however, glad to see a surge in new dApps being created, at least a thousand of them in the past few years. But on almost every dimension, they are worse than their centralized counterparts. Decentralized apps are slower, they're more expensive, less capable, have worse user experiences, they have volatile and uncertain governance. They are not a pleasure to use as much as I'd like them to be, except for CryptoKitties. And that's because there are certain structural trade-offs that result directly from the primary design goal of these services that's prioritized above all others, decentralization. We need only look back at the history of the internet to see the parallels between the rise of the early web and this new decentralized web. The dot-com bubble was caused by crazy high valuations, ill-informed speculation, and utopian promises of a better future. If there's one takeaway we should have from that era, it's that digital networks and code aren't a solution to human brokenness. Instead of leading us to truth, the internet gave us all an opportunity to build our own personal knowledge universe, which catalyzed a detachment in society from actual fact that has led to the rise of propaganda-fed authoritarianism globally. Instead of freeing ourselves from the manipulation of corporations and governments, the internet became the most powerful tool of surveillance behavioral manipulation and control ever created in human history. We should hold on to our idealism as developers. We're building this new world and the code we write, the applications we build, will deeply affect the future of humanity. But we need to be careful to not fall victim to the same exact fallacies that our hacker forebearers embraced in the 90s. We've learned a lot in this past decade about what doesn't work. So far, it's not decentralization, but convenience that's been the commodity our generation values the most. In fact, we value convenience so much that we choose to use services like Amazon despite how it treats its workers and despite how it's becoming increasingly pervasive in every aspect of our lives. But it turns out that there is a growing trend of distrust towards centralized everything over the past few years, and that is now starting to include the biggest tech companies. Data regulation laws are being enacted across the world and people are waking up to many problems with centralized services. We shouldn't be building more trustless systems. Instead, we should be building more trust full systems, systems that allow us to more easily trust other humans. Trust isn't something that we need to remove the need for. It's something to strengthen with technology. It's going to take a societal shift in consciousness towards valuing things like privacy, data ownership, and algorithmic transparency. But that's not hard to imagine. Until recently, encrypted messaging was only used by hackers, spies, and this guy. But in the post Snowden era, everyone seems to be using Signal or Telegram. WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. The press solicit tips through SecureDrop. And of course, the technology improved. But it's mainly changes in society that drove that adoption. Humans will deploy any technology for both good and evil, for the realization of freedom and tyranny, for charity and for greed. So let's move fast and iterate on what we've learned. To begin, let's all start using the term distributed ledger technology or DLT instead of blockchain. The enterprise has already started to adopt that term. It's less triggering and more generalized a term. It pushes away from blockchain's association with the wild west of crypto and ICOs. Next, I want to demonstrate four real-world uses of this technology that profitable businesses have already been built on in finance, medicine, manufacturing, and government. 
Let's start with finance. Over 2 billion people in the developing world remain unbanked. That's one in every five adults. Financial inclusion is considered a key factor in poverty reduction. The unbanked population of global utilities customers has gone largely unrecognized. They've been left to wait in line at local utility offices to make payments in hard currency, often in uncomfortable and unsafe areas. This all feeds into a cycle of poverty, disabling them from financial stability and thus stoking the fires of political instability. But Humanic is a startup using DLT to create an identifiable bank account for any human in the cloud. That's one piece of the financial inclusivity puzzle. Next comes credit. Services like Bloom are being used as a basis for risk assessment and credit scoring. This allows people to gain access to their credit worthiness and lets them use credit cards. It tracks a user's credit score over time to verify who who a safe debtor could be by using DLT. Bibliograph allows people to save, transfer, and invest their wealth, creating a cycle of wealth generation. There are so many processes and services that a bank provides, and we can decouple each of those and turn each of them into standalone businesses that can provide financial inclusion for people in the developing world. Next is medicine. Ever wonder why you have to fill out a new form every time you see a new doctor? Most healthcare is provided by separate, independent practices without efficient methods of communicating with each other. We could store that data on a server, but controlled by who? Medical data is sensitive, Encrypting it and storing it on a DLT empowers patients with a self-sovereign health identity, a global holistic record of encrypted medical data that can be shared between any health provider you choose. That's what Mint Health is working on. It's tamper-proof since DLTs are immutable technology, so the patient doesn't have to worry. And this idea of sharing data between multiple parties that don't know each other can be applied to any kind of supply chain. In a typical supply chain scenario, there are multiple independent parties that take some payload from point A to point B, and there has to be a way to keep track of it all. An independent, tamper-proof ledger that records where and when some product has been delivered is what a DLT can uniquely provide. Suku is doing just that, an efficient, transparent, and collaborative dashboard that lets each party see where the product is in whichever industry. And just last month, West Virginia became the first state in the U.S to allow people to vote online using a DLT in a federal election, piloting the program for military and other voters living overseas by partnering with the Boston-based startup called Votes. The app works by recording votes on the ledger, then facial recognition tech verifies the voter's identity by comparing it to a driver's license or other photo ID, and their vote is recorded on the ledger where each is mathematically proven. Anyone can vote from anywhere in the world with no potential for human error since it's tamper-proof. 144 West Virginia voters stationed in 30 countries cast their ballots with votes for the 2018 midterm election. The ICO model is already evolving into ETOs, or equity token offerings. In an ETO, investors are issued actual equity tokens, which give them an unparalleled level of legal protection by providing them rights similar to equities. This means far less scamming. Scalability is definitely an issue, but Vitalik's got some really cool ideas involving quadratic sharding. He wants Ethereum to be operating at Visa levels in three years using it. Sharding means splitting the entire state of the network into a bunch of partitions called shards that contain their own independent piece of state and transaction history. Certain nodes would process transactions only for certain shards, allowing the throughput of transactions processed in total across all shards to be much higher than the current standard. And while Bitcoin is definitely slow, it's still an immutable ledger. Side chains that use Faster consensus mechanisms like proof of stake can be pegged to Bitcoin, allowing for a second layer of operability. This is something that developers in the space are excited to have fully developed in 2019. Using side chains, we can take advantage of Bitcoin's immutability and decentralization, avoid its volatility, and also leverage the speed of a much faster consensus mechanism on a different DLT. Overall, three things to remember 
remember from this video. The distributed ledger technology space is still evolving. We've learned a lot from ICO scams and subpar decentralized apps. There are profitable businesses using DLT out there right now providing financial services to the developing world and in a few other fields. And moving forward, we can focus on scaling solutions like quadratic sharding and proof of stake sidechain to Bitcoin to create the dApps of the future. Where do you think blockchain is going? Let me know in the comment section and please subscribe for more programming videos. For now, I've got to use my bank. So thanks for watching.